Um, my sermon this morning, whoa, <laughs> I hope the fonts don't do crazy things all the way through because that's not how it appeared when I wrote it, but that's how it appeared when I saved it apparently. But uh, <laughs> the, My sermon this morning is the impossible made possible. And I gotta be. I gotta tell you, um, I uh, I would really like to be sitting down and listening to this one. I have had such an awful week. Whew. Between difficult duties and difficult conversations, and encountering my own frailty in a dramatic way, whew. I've had such a hard week. And uh, I got to tell you, preaching a gospel of hope when you're hurting and down is a hard thing to do. I wish that I could be listening to this one with you. But there is, I think, in every Christian, in the hardest of times and the most difficult of weeks, when you're confronted by the most troubling of things, there is this, this kernel of wonder that tells us that, okay, in the midst of this trouble, my God is still my God. And that no matter how I hurt or what pain I face, and no matter how impossible things may seem, no matter how defeated I may be on every turn, Jesus Christ went to the cross and He was defeated too, and yet God converted it into victory. And so there is no impossible with God. And uh, if I am successful in preaching a sermon of hope this morning, that'll be a demonstration of that truth. He'll accomplish that. Please pray for me today. I usually, uh, uh, actually, let me go ahead and do this. Uh, this is what, a, what the, I think the overall message of this is, is that kernel is found in our childlike hearts. That kernel of wonder and, 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 and beauty and, and hope and, and the belief that God can work even in me, even in these circumstances, even in my life, whatever it is that you're facing, God can do it. Wait, there are times in our hearts to say, I, I don't know. The disciples got into an argument, as they were often wont to do. They're sitting here in this nascent kingdom, walking around with the one they believe to be king. But of course, he doesn't have any army, and he doesn't have a throne. And they're looking at it saying, when is this finally going to turn over and all change? And when it does, who gets to be the vizier, right? Who gets to be the grand poobah? I mean, I know Jesus gets to be king. But he's called the 12 of us together, and which one of us is going to be greatest? And Jesus calls a child, sticks him in the middle of him, and says, look, unless you turn and become like this, you won't really enter my kingdom. Because his kingdom isn't about the stuff of this world, the stuff that tells you that you're worthless, the stuff that tells you it can't go well, the stuff that tells you that that, man, you're, you're a terrible parent, or you're an awful husband. The stuff that tells you that you're married to a fool and nothing can ever get right. The stuff that tells you that you can't fix this. I'll... He's saying, no. Children don't worry about any of that. Children just trust you. And he's saying, you know what? If, if you will nurture that child's heart, down in the middle there. That kernel that believes that God is in fact God, even now, even in this hard place, God is God. Even in the middle of all your suffering and your grief and your woe, God is God. And you say, it's impossible, nothing can go well, but there's part of you that knows better. We become so sophisticated. We become grown-ups and we think we know. We think we're, we're able to, to, to look at the world and, and say, well, I know what can happen here, and I know, I know what can't. Down deep inside of us is the heart of a young person. 
I know that there is in me. Somewhere inside of me is, I think it's 13, based on my sense of humor. Uh, there is that still that person that believes. Even in the hardest days. And Jesus is calling us and saying, become like children. Children with a wondrous faith that looks at all that sophistication and says, you don't know my God. Seems like God will often let things get hard, though, won't He? It's almost like He wants to prove this to us, so He allows the impossible to develop. I wanted to do this with pictures, but I was like, as I was trying to build them, I'm like, <laughs> there are no pictures of this. So uh, let me just go ahead and, and try and sketch this out. And let me do it with the story of God. What God has done, you know, the, the beginning of the gospel, which is what we foc at, focus on during the Advent season, the, the birth of Christ among us, the coming of God, the invasion, the incarnation, that's, that's the part of the gospel we focus on. But remember, that's not the beginning of the story. When that part of the story begins, there's a whole lot of story that's already happened. And it's led us to huh, impossible places. Things start looking impossible from the very beginning when they're driven out of the garden, right? How can every, anything ever get better? If it's up to Adam and Eve, it can't. They're living in exile, in permanent exile on the earth that was created for their habitation. They're no longer at home, at home. They live as a stranger in their own world. And how do they find their way home? They can't. And things go from bad to worse. The disaster builds until finally God comes calls one man, one man, and says, I'm going to bless every family that's on this cursed earth, and I'm going to do it through you, Abram. Come with me, and I'll fix it all. But how can it happen? He's a nothing. He's a nobody. He's small. And the problem is so huge. And not only that, he's supposed to do it through his offspring. He doesn't have any offspring. And God lets it just Stretch out. He's 70 when he's called. He didn't have that kid till he's 100 years old. It's like God wants to say, I'm a God of impossible stuff. But boy, that's not the only time he proves that, is it? Because when, when it, it grows, I mean, it seems like there are times when there's, there's times of glory and wonder, like under Moses, as Moses leads the people and they're free, and then they're immediately a junk people. They're grumbling and griping and complaining all over the place. And it's like, these are the people who are supposed to be the saviors of the world? They're supposed to bless everybody? They aren't even a blessing to themselves. They don't love their God. They're stiff-necked and they have to die at the bites of serpents. This faithful Moses is so glorious and it's immediately so problematic. Or you have... Under the kings, you have this wonder of the reign of David. And this time, it's not the people that's the problem, it's David. He blows it and messes everything up with his adultery and his sexual picadillos and then his murder. Hamelot destroyed. And then born into that lineage is a disaster upon a disaster. There's, there's only three good kings in the lot. It's all a mess. The, the world gets divided and split up. This, this people who are supposed to bless the whole world can't even cooperate. They hate each other. And then they're dragged away into exile. <sighs> Everything's lost. It's impossible. Ah, oh, but they get to come back. So what? They come back, they rebuild a temple, and they are under people's feet. All the time. They are never their own people again. I've, for a hundred years, if you know the intertestamental period, for a hundred years under the reign of a family called Maccabee, they have this brief revolt, you know, and, and they triumph and they're free and yay, everything finally is going to work out. Nothing works out. The Romans come and they're right back down. And when our story starts, you got an oppressed people. And the people who are supposed to be kings and queens have become carpenters. How on earth can this mess bless the world? It is not possible. How can anything be okay? And in our own lives, do you ever feel that? 
Things have become so complex. I mean, that story that I just told you, that's the story of Old Testament up to the New. You know, and, and, and there's, there's all this disaster, and it just, folks, if you look at it big picture, it is a slide down, everything coming apart all the time. You know, we get better, we fall apart again. It's, it's just constantly a mess. And that story, I, it resonates with me. I feel that. I'm such a mess. And I'm supposed to be a good man? God, can you make a good man inside this skin? Ever felt that? Maybe I'm lonely. The rest of you are saints. Impossible. It's all impossible. But remember, that story that I told you is the story God wrote. He did that on purpose. Just as He let Abraham grow impossibly old before the kid come, He he lets the kingdom fall into impossible decay before He revives it. Because He wants us to know that it's never hopeless, even when it's hopeless. It's never beyond His work. And so, to do that, He begins with a child. I don't know how old Mary actually was. The Scripture doesn't bother to tell us. She couldn't have been 20. And in her culture, she's probably a lot younger. For some of you, it's probably very difficult to imagine what it's like to be 20 because you're teenagers. But for some of you, you may have some shadowy memory of it. Maybe not. (laughs) Some vague sense of, do you remember what it was like when all the world was before you? Where it was out there waiting to be discovered? You weren't so sophisticated yet. You did not know yet just how defeated you would become. You hadn't encountered yet the problems that were inside of you that that would flower and grow and you would have to prune. And maybe they'd already started showing up, but, but not where they are now. And so you, 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 all you knew was, oh man, God, I can't wait. Who will I be? What will I be? What will you do with me? And it's all laying before you. That is that woman. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel, by the way, that's the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy from the last week's. Story In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent to God, sent by God to a city of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. We have this, this young woman, unspoiled by life. She has not yet had a husband. and Everything is still filled with hope and wonder. She is about as far removed as she could possibly be from last week's sermon. Zechariah. Zechariah, the beaten, the broken down, the defeated. Zechariah, the childless and familyless old priest who, who was hopeless. This is a woman filled with hope. And here comes God to ruin her life, right? Because the angel shows up and, and he came to her and he said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Now, do you remember Zachariah's response last week? We talked about this. Do you remember how Zachariah, and he didn't even talk to him yet. The angel's standing by beside the altar, and Zachariah sees him. He's, ah, right? She shows up, and, she, and, and he actually talks to her. Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. What kind of person must she have been up to this point? Filled up with a kind of innocence, a kind of wonder. Your heart must become like a child. This is someone getting that right. You'll note the difference also between her and Zechariah. Zechariah was immediately filled up with fear, but she's greatly troubled. Like, well, this is weird, but the word fear is not there. You know, I think that despair drives you easily toward fear. She's still filled with wonder, and she's just, ah, right? And she tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be, meaning she's actually thinking. I think Zachariah wasn't, but she's going, what? 
What do you mean? Me? Who am I there that God should be with me? And he says to her, and the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus, and he will be great and called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now, you and I know the rest of the story because in order for a kingdom to have no end, you've got to kind of deal with the death problem. Well, we know that he did, and we know how he did. We know that she, he is, she has just heard the gospel in this micro little moment with the angel. But of course, she doesn't know any of that. We know it. We can unpack it. She's not heard it. So all she can focus on is this one thing. Uh, angel, how am I going to have a kid? There's no kings coming from me yet because I've not married. I'm not sexually active. I don't have any babies and I can't have any babies. So she's looking at an angel and you realize she is asking nearly the same question and from nearly the same causes as the story before. You know, how will this be? I'm a virgin is so similar to how can this be? I am an, how will I know this? I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. Those are both questions that say, no baby's coming for me. But that can't happen because I, you know, it's, <laughs> I need to explain this to God, but let me tell you how this works, okay? I've got a cute little book. You know, I mean, we'll, we'll explain it to you, God, but this is not how it works. But you'll note that, that he kind of bears a punishment Right? That, that he gets a punishment. And she doesn't. What she gets is an explanation. I've got to tell you, I think there's a reason for that. I think their hearts are in radically different places. Zachariah's heart is filled with, with years. Years and years of childlessness. And everything he'd longed for and hoped for, dashed and over and gone, and he can't have anything that he wanted. And so he's learned to identify God as the God who fails him and lets him down. He's learned to believe that God can't. She's young. And she hasn't, she hasn't held that yet. And so in her is what we all are meant to become, a kind of wondrous trust. She's not saying, angel, that's, that's, uh, that's impossible because God can't. She's saying, angel, I don't get it. And so what she gets is an explanation. Uh, whoops, I seem to have skipped the slide. Yeah, I did. Okay, so uh, what she gets is an explanation. I actually want to read the words. So uh, hum the Jeopardy theme song, will you? Uh, thank you. <laughs> Here we go. You're done. Uh, <laughs> and the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. She gets an explanation where Zechariah gets a curse. He's told to be quiet. What's being told to be quiet is his despair and faithlessness. What's being, told, what's being explained to here is that child's heart. Because the prayer, that, that it can be almost the same prayer. You can say, God, I don't get it. How can you do this? And you can say it through the prism of despair. And God will say, you don't trust me yet. Or you can say it through the prism of faith and say, God, I'm, I, I just don't know how. What do you want of me? What can I do? Or what will you do with me? And when that's where your heart is, God's like, this is a person I can work with. Let me tell you it's going to happen. It was essential that the explanation be given because you and I needed to hear it. We needed to know that she actually was a virgin when the child was born. You know, we needed to know that, yes, this wasn't Joseph's biological child. And so the angel is explaining not just to her, but to the universe and across the ages so that everyone would know God is doing the impossible. And he was, tell he was telling you that so that He could speak also into your life when times of despair and trouble and pain and defeat and sin and shame, when those times come upon you, He's saying it is not impossible. Look what I did! If I can do that, I can do this. 
If I can work in that impossible situation, then I can work in yours. You are not beyond my help. I can rescue and I can save. And to prove it even further, that was in the future. He's saying, I'm going to do this through you, Mary, just to make sure that you'll know, Mary, that you can trust me. Behold, it's already happened. Behold, your relative Elizabeth is in her old age and has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for he, she who was called barren. It's essential that it's not just she who was barren. It's she who was mocked. She who was derided. She who was treated with contempt. She who was assumed to be under God's curse. She for whom joy was impossible. It has become overwhelmingly possible. She is loaded with joy and has been for months. And this now, Mary, is a sign to you that I can do the impossible. I already have and I will again. If you're like me, you want to say, well, I want a sign. There it is. That's what the Gospel is. It is your sign in the difficult days that this truth is true. Uh, whoops. I lost my verse again. <laughs> Nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible with God. And what God has done is announced that to us in our most difficult days. No matter what trouble we face, no matter how hard, the, no matter how deep the pain, nothing will be impossible with God. And those who hear it, and those who believe it with the faith of a child are able to say, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Whatever you want, God, I'm down for the game. No matter how deep the pain goes, no matter how many tears this world squeezes out of me, I will not let go of you because you are my hope, my salvation, and my song. You are the joy of my life, God, because I live in a world filled with impossibilities, but not with you. You are the God of impossible made possible. And that's the truth of the Gospel. And I will believe it no matter what comes. Because someday, that belief is going to pay off. Usually, it's not very far. Sometimes, I outlive, I, my hope outlives me. And, and I might live my entire life hoping for something that never shows up. My uh, dad was a big Cubs fan, and he died in 2009. And when was it that they finally won the pennant? He lived his entire life in hope. Sometimes your hope outlives you. But the hope that is placed in Christ Jesus our Lord will bring us back to life so that we can see its fulfillment. And he is no fool who places his hope in the Lord in the most difficult days. He is no fool who becomes a child for the sake of God. I've had a hard week. But I have a good God. And no matter what comes your way, church, no matter what, you can hope in the Lord your God. Maybe you've had a hard week too and you need the prayers of the church and if that's you, we want to do it. Let's pray for you. And if uh, it may be that you've been dealing with something that's heavy and big and, and you need the care of the church, but I haven't addressed it, but you brought it here, don't leave it. You know, leave it here. Leave it with us. Let us pray. And if you're not a Christian, <laughs> today's the day to become one. If you're subject this morning to the invitation of God, why don't you come right here? while we stand and sing.